Okay, so I'm going to talk about the eight, just eight cent queens. I'm going to talk about anything else from Lab One. And when you really look hard at it, it's amazing just how many different ones there are, how many different printings and issues and overprints and all sorts of things. So I thought I'd just start off by saying there are three types of specimen. Now, one's an artificial one. And I think these mostly probably came from the Australian colonies. When Ray, were... I don't yes. think you're on the full screen at your end. Okay. Um, Down in the corner. That's it. Uh, I, I think... Hmm, I'll turn that lot off. Does that give me full screen? No. If you go down oh. in the bottom right-hand corner, next to yes. where it says 147%. Ah. Yes. If you click on the little screen next to the left of 100 and... Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah, yeah there, there we go. Okay. Yeah, now you're in full screen. That's great. Okay. All right. So there are three types of specimens you can find. Uh, these were officially sent to the UPU. Um, this one's what you might consider proper printing. These ones are hand stamped and pretty rough and ready. And these ones, I think, came from the Australian colonies. So that's what we're looking at. We're basically just a queen's head with uh, some Chinese on the right-hand side, some Jawi or Malay on the left-hand side. Now, I just have a table of printings just to show you how many there are. And I'm including things with overprints. Now, things that are eight cents overprinted, and then eight cents, which have been overprinted. And we'll talk a little bit about why there are so many overprints. Now, Lab One was joined up to what was then the General Postal Union with a, a group of British Crown colonies. And really, there were, there were very few people who were literate or even interested in sending mail of any sort other than maybe the administrator or the governor and things like that. But they were joined up with a group of other Crown Colonies and a requirement was to be a member, you had to issue postage stamps. In 1877, Lab One had no postage stamps. A, a, Sago Palm was suggested by the colony and the Crown agents rather chose a simple design with the Queen's head on it and four values were prepared in very small quantities from about 12 or 1300 up to about two or three thousand. And the Postal Union wanted green for printed matter, red for a local letter, blue for overseas mail, and they used the postage rates of the state settlements. So this is the first issue, 16 cent one, uh, wide margins. It's got a watermark, which uh, I'm not sure which way this one goes, but it's either to the uh, left or to the right. Uh, and they didn't fit very well because they cover two stamps, but you can usually work out what they are. Before the new stamps arrived in Laban, the straight settlements reduced their rates. So the colours were wrong. And instead of a local letter being 12 cents, which required a red stamp, they became 8 cents, which now should be a red stamp. So some 8 cent red stamps were ordered. And the postmaster in Lab One decided he had to have an, a red stamp and put a surcharge on it so that the colour was correct. And so here are a few examples of what the result was. Um, eight, and they're all, all on 12 cent stamps. Uh, eight, well, some of these are upright, some are sideways, sideways there, upright or upside down. Some just had a bit of blob of red ink, some had a blob of black ink, there are even some with um, two eights, which I didn't have one of those to show you. Uh, and inevitably, 
uh, forgeries because I, I guess about a, a, a thousand, sorry, a hundred stamps were overprinted, not much more than that. So for collectors, well, how are you going to get one? So here are three examples. The middle one at least is on a 12 cent stamp. So this reads 12 cents, the Chinese version of it, with two eights on it. This one actually came with a, a royal certificate to say it was a forgery. And here we have a two cent stamp. Still saying two cent in Chinese and two cent in Jawi. And someone's added a red one beside the, beside the two. As to this one, well, what can you say? It's just appalling. I don't think anyone would ever be taken in by that. It filled a space. So those ran out pretty quickly and it was a bit inconvenient because those are all hand stamped. Um, and so now, again, hand stamped, but bigger letters, easier to see and actually quite well done. But again, it's probably a couple of hundred stamps, not very many, one complete sheet. And it's again on the 12 cent stamp so that you've got a red eight cent stamp uh, paying the mail to Singapore. And then there was a third one. And this time, uh, upper and lower case, uh, done in, well, some of it are in rows of five at a time. Some are in sheets of 10. I think there are three different printings, at least there might even be a fourth. And they kept using up all the 12 cent stamp, which was really now obsolete, turning them into eight cent stamps so they can use them on their mail to straight settlements and within the colony. And finally, three years after they first issued a postage stamp, we had an eight cent common stamp to send on their ordinary mail. Sheets of 12, Crown Colony watermark, they're often a bit blurred and there's an engraving mistake. And to show you why there are engraving mistakes in these stamps, uh, this is imaginary, but I guess this is something that they began with. We had a die, it had complete, except for the inscription in Malay, the inscription in Chinese and the denomination. And they, all these issues, have something like that as its basis. The engraver hand engraved on each image on the plate, the Malay and the Chinese and the number. And inevitably the engraver perhaps got a bit sick of doing these, um, fairly fine work and he's got to do it backwards on the, on the plate. Um, and in some of these, on the, on the last stamp on the sheet, the dot was left out. Now it makes a difference to the pronunciation in Malay. Um, I don't know how much difference it makes to the meaning. Someone might know, but I don't. Right, so here we have the first eight cent red stamp, eight, eight cent carbon. Um, sheet of 12, sorry, 10, it's a sheet of 10. Wide margins, these, these are big enough to print another stamp on them. And at some time, I think probably some people did do those sorts of things, a nice little piece of watermark paper, you could do other things with it. Um, and the missing dot is on stamp number 10. The next time some were ordered, the paper, the watermark had changed. So virtually every printing came with a new watermark. So here we have a block of four of the Crown CA watermark. The printing seems a bit deeper or, or perhaps as if the plate was inked more heavily or the, uh, somehow the, the ink stuck to the plate a bit better with, with uh, this one, or maybe it was the paper. But anyway, they look rather deeper in color than the previous one on the CC paper. But of course, the letter rate was reduced again. 
And in the middle of 1885, a red two cent stamp was required. And so again, eight cent stamps were surcharged. And here we have uh, the eight cent with a uh, single line overprint. And these were in sheets of 10 and the bold diagonal surcharge in sheets of 10. And I think what was happening is the local printer produced these when the post office said, hey, we need some more. He printed them and he kept trying to improve the surcharge so it was easy to see. And so now we look at other eight cent stamps because the eight cent, instead of being red for the letter eight, became purple. And the first printing is on Crown CA paper, probably a purple color, although the catalogs and things differ in their description of the color. But the second printing is mauve and it's on paper with narrow margins, same plate and the missing dot is still there. So here we have, um, this actually is a bit of a cheat because the, the margin at the side has been added on somewhere. Um, but the sheet of 10 uh, wide margins, uh, fairly deep color. Then the one with narrow margins is, is lighter in its shade and it doesn't have enough margin to actually pull off the margin and turn it into a stamp of your liking. And again, quite clearly here, you can see this missing dot. So there was no attempt to correct it. Uh, it just went through. And finally, I'm not sure that any of the previous stamps are known on cover. There may be one or two, and Jeremy would know if there are one or two, but there certainly aren't very many. But the eight cent purple uh, started to be used and used fairly extensively. And as you can see here, it's registered, it's paid overseas mail and um, six eights of 48, I think it's a double weight. And a lot of these seem to have to do something with banking because all their banking seem to be in the Channel Islands. Once again, 1891, another postage rate change. For foreign mail or overseas mail, the cost was reduced from eight cents to six cents. There were no six cents available. And so the eight cent issues were surcharged with one of two types of overprint. Here's a complete sheet narrow margins, the second printing of the eight cent. And there are two, and they were hand stamped, so hand surcharges. And this one has one millimeter between the two lines. This one has two millimeters between the two lines. And presumably maybe the post -op, postmaster and a clerk both took turns, one had a, this one and the other one had that one and they could happily produce as many six cent stamps as they needed. However, some funny business started this time. Most of the surcharges are in black, but some are in red. And then there start to be inverted surcharges, double surcharges, missing six, missing cents and others. Um, sheets with a double surcharge, one inverted on the last stamp of the sheet, which of course has the missing dot as well. And you can see these sort of things turn up in auctions and often at, uh, suggested at very uh, high prices for what were probably people trying to play around and make themselves a bit of money. A few sheets of the stamps from the first printing with wide margins were also surcharged. Not very many of them because the first printing by the time these were done were virtually obsolete. There may have been a couple left in the drawer. And so you can see clearly here which one is from the first print printing, that's this one. And it's got an upside down surcharge. 
and here's a, a red one. And it's also upside down. I think the upside down ones tend to be quite a bit more frequently seen than the ones that are the right way up. But there are also plenty of ordinary ones upside down. The printer then suggested that um, since they should be using more eight cent stamps, maybe they should make a larger plate and one with 30 impressions on it instead of just 10. Okay, so the suggestion came from the printer and the postmaster in the colony said, yes, all right. It was six years before any stamps were produced from the plate. So someone had their calculations wrong. By the time these stamps came out, Labuan was no longer a crown colony and they are only entitled to use unwatermarked paper. And so here we are, it's really a change of color again. Uh, rows of six, five of them, sorry, one, two, three, <laughs> that's wrong. There are five rows of six and all the side panels were engraved by hand. When you actually look closely at these stamps, you can see quite a lot of little dots where the engraver was resting between doing his engraving. And you could almost plate them by looking at where the engraver rests his engraving tool by the little dots and things which are quite common on these stamps. But all the side panels were engraved by hand. And there are now quite a lot of small flaws. And most of these seem to be in setting up the plate rather than in the hand engraving. So I've just shown a couple of them here. Here's one on position eight. The piece of in, um, curl here doesn't have a tail and it joins the middle part of the, uh, uh, I've forgotten what you call these things, <laughs> uh, the, the curve in the main part of the ornament. If you look at the other stamp here, you can see this is what most stamps are like. They have a, a curl, it doesn't touch the adjoining curl in the middle and it has a tail, whereas this one has no tail. However, this one, the bottom curl has no tail. If you look at the way most of the stamps are, there's a tail. And there are quite a lot of these sorts of flaws or, or varieties in these sheets. Um, I don't, even in the engraved one, I don't know that we really have a good solid list, which is easy to use to say, ah, here I have stamp number so-and-so and stamp number so-and-so. But they are fairly easily plateable. The only two or three positions which are, don't have a, a variety of some sort. So here there's a dot which is probably where the engraver just rested his um, um, cutting tool as he had to uh, in hand engrave all these 30 positions on the sheet. Now, the engraved one came out in about 1893 and it was due to be replaced in the middle of 1894 by the uh, fancy pictorials. And yes, some in these engraved ones did get into the post office and have been used. You can find them. There are some on cover, uh, some with used postmarks. However, it was then suggested that they were suddenly making so many eights and queens, and I think it was about 10,000 were, were printed, uh, that they should produce them by lithography and make lithographic transfers and print with a stone and print 180 stamps at a time. Well, this was done. And in doing that, your small floors, well, you now had six complete sheets of images on the stone. And the small floors, which are on the engraved plate now appear six times on the lithographic stone. And a whole lot of new varieties appear. Uh, including some bad transfers, doubles, um, some of them have doubled corners and all sorts of things. 
Now, that's a much more detailed thing, so I'm not going to do any more than that. Just say the sheets of 180 are cut into post dollar sheets of 30. Um, it almost certainly would seem that they had philatelic sales in mind. Why else would they be producing 100,000 of these when probably no more than 50,000 eight cent stamps had ever been sold before? And they also knew that within a few months they'd be replaced. Of course, most stamps were cancelled to order, probably in London, and they were sold to the stamp packet trade. So here's, here's the lithographic sheet. There aren't very many of them around. They're quite scarce. Uh, most of them ended up like this and probably separated into singles. So they've got these hand cancelled bars on them in blocks of four. And they were sold to schoolboys. Fred Parker bought the remainder stock, all CTO. And when the stocks of Labuan, exotic places from exotic countries like Labuan ran out, you had some forgers stepping in. The most common forgery, and I have here a sheet, thanks to Peter Coburn, who sold it to me. These are very uncommon too in sheets, any amount of them around otherwise. Sheets of 20. Uh, the stamp lover celebrating the centenary of uh, Labuan stamps managed to put a sheet of 20 of a forgery on the front cover of the stamp lover <laughs> in 1977. So that's an interesting one. Gibbons, their illustration of the Queen in the catalogue in part one, up until about 1995 or 1998, uh, when it was pointed out to Hugh Jeffrey that actually it was a forgery and they changed it to a genuine stamp. But so there are plenty of forgeries around and plenty of people still trying to sell them on eBay and places like that, and even in major auction houses. And so here are some more examples of forgeries. Here's the genuine thing. Uh, here's a lithographic one, which is common. This is the one in sheets of 20. Um, quite crude, really, compared to this one. Um, imitation bars on the corner. Uh, weak lines and things. This one, I think, is a Japanese production for souvenir sets of stamps sold to tourists. The original stamp is a two cent. It has two cent in Chinese down this side, and two cent in Malay down that side. But they, were, they used plugs to make the various values. And, and here's another example of a plug. The plug is eight to make the eight cent stamp. Didn't bother them about the inscriptions. Um, and there's this one, which John asked me about and was puzzled by it. Here we have an eight cent stamp. It's perfectly good, doesn't look anything wrong with it. Until you look at the Chinese, Ooh, it says two cent down the side. And the Jawi also says two cents down the side. Someone has probably scraped off the two and printed an eight over the top. And I bought that as being a genuine one and um, pointed it out to the vendor eventually and didn't pay very much for it. And then this is a modern production on nice white paper, clean, beautiful looking. And I think there is one sheet of this stamp uh, printed at the time, upside down. And there are now if you want one, I think you can still buy one on eBay with an inverted eight cents, beautifully clean and nice. And I think it's about 20 pounds. Okay, uh, some references. The original stuff about Labuan was really written by Fred Melvin, published in Given Stamp Monthly, never issued in separate form. The first separate handbook is Hans von Rudolfi um, in the new handbook series. Um, and it's reasonably comprehensive. 
and it's been translated into English and published in the Sarawak Journal, volumes 19 and 20. Uh, then there's my book, which is 1991, and lots of bits are out of date and need to be updated. There are a few chapters which have been updated and are probably outdated again. And it'll be a while before the second edition appears. Uh, John Easton has most of the details about printing sizes and orders and when they were printed and things like that in his Delarue history. And because the govern, governing of Labuan was uh, put into the hands of the North Borneo Company in 1889, the stamps which were on um, unwatermarked paper uh, were actually produced by the British North Borneo Company or authorised by them. And so they are included in the first part of the uh, North Borneo Handbook. Now, uh, Les didn't really make a very good fist of it. Uh, okay, it's all there. Um, his illustrations, sometimes they're forgeries and so on. And um, I think my, my book was an attempt to try and improve on what's in the handbook. Okay, so that's it. Thank you, Ray. Um, if, uh, if people would like to ask questions, where you go. Oh, can I just add a little to <clears throat> the original dies were engraved with a pantograph machine, which is in Ray's book. Um, <laughs> The pantograph machine was a donking machine, which Delarue had got hold of because um, they got transferred the medicine labels and the donking machine was used for engraving the, um, the double dies, whose name escapes me for the moment, uh, where they printed two colours at the same time. Um, and they were able to use the donking pantograph to do all the engraving. It's just a trivial thing and the other one was that the the fact that you get the reverse watermarks particularly with the crown cc's is because <clears throat> the crown cc and crown ca papers were designed for litho uh, for uh, typography and they weren't very good for engraved issues because they had to be damped and the surfaces weren't very good at picking up the color and they found that actually doing them back to front was better. Um, there's just a couple of trivial ones there. Okay. Yeah. You, you can get the watermarks in every direction, upside down and roundabout and back to yeah, front. They, 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 them they, cut the, they cut the paper up before they printed them. So yeah, there was yeah, just that, No, I think that's because they had lots of trouble because they had the same problem uh, with the Perkin Bacon plates that they got transferred, that got transferred to them, that they had enormous difficulties formulating the inks properly and actually getting decent transfers onto onto the crown C, particularly onto crown CC paper to start with. Uh, so there you go. Yeah. Ray, your your Campbell cover to uh, Jersey. Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Yes, your Campbell cover to Jersey, um, 1871 to 1888, there's only about 20 covers known from Sarawak, uh, um, known, uh, and three of them are to Campbell in Jersey. Oh. And I think yeah. he, he may be a philatelist. Um, I got a question. Well, but yes, although you know, double double weight and registered, yeah. I think it had to do something with the banking system because you do get a lot of a lot of the banking transactions seem to be with Jersey. I will find out in half an hour's time because I'm doing my um, rehearsal to the Royal, and Mark Bailey, the IT chairman, is a Jersey study circle guy. Oh, okay. And he'll yep. know, and I'll let you know. Okay. Yep. A lot of um, civil servants from North Borneo, anyway, retired to Jersey. 
and um, some of the best covers around, um, you know, like Gentian covers and things like that from 1900, are actually addressed to Jersey. So okay. maybe Mr. Campbell had something to do with that. Okay. Right, yes. I think John Higgins had something to show us. Yes, I do. Now, what do I do? Do I share screen? Yes. Um, now I've got to go on to that. Share, I guess. Um, oh. I want to go on to slideshow. Right, okay. Um, I have to say this is my favourite item. Maybe first of all, Ray, thank you very much indeed. That was an excellent resume of the complicated history of the eight cents. Um, well worth doing because it took a bit of it takes a bit of sorting out. Um, anyway, this is my favourite item. I actually bid for this when I was in Albania. So <laughs> uh, <laughs> marooned there because I couldn't get out because they're having an election and uh, everything was sort of uh, shut down but not <laughs> luckily not the internet so, uh, so there we are so I was very pleased to get that that was originally well I don't know originally but it was in Patrick Cassell's collection um, as you can see what it is it is an essay um, uh, this is the original document uh, signed by Hamilton the, the postmaster um, and because it's such a large document, I have actually cut it into two, not, not actually, virtually cut it into two. Um, and there we are at the top of the document. And there you can see that I imagine must be it's um, the time it was received, 2nd of June, 81. Um, and you can read the writing, it's very clear actually. You can see what he's asking for. And so that's a 12 cent, which is replacing with the, uh, the changes of design that Hamilton is asking for. Uh, and that's the bottom of the document. Um, once again, you've seen the same a 12 cent stamp and there in a piece of a fixed um, tissue paper is the, uh, the changes that he's requesting and there is his well-known uh, uh, signature. Um, the other item, couple of items I want to show you is um, a plate proof, well sort of. Um, so there's three of these which are numbered, these are from the Delar archives as was the previous item. So there's three of these which are numbered sequentially 534, uh, 4, 5 and 6. There's also the 2 cent, of which I've got one of them, uh, which is numbered 1, 2 and 3 and the 10 cent I believe it is, which is 7, 8 and 9. Now I believe that these were uh, struck uh, when the 10 cent, 10, 10 uh, set plate was retired um, and when it was replaced by the 30 set plate. So it wasn't actually done <coughs> at the time of the uh, 8 cent being issued or beforehand. It was actually more or less a sort of um, a memento uh, that was put into the, uh, the archives, the Delarue archives. Um, I think you've got the details there of what the uh, what is printed on, etc. Pretty item. Um, and then we have um, a cent Carmine on cover. Um, as Ray said, there aren't many of these around, um, and this may be the earliest known registered cover from the Buen. Um, it's a triple rate on a Majesty's service. So this is still a crown colony, of course. It remained a crown colony, even when it was being administered by North Borneo. Um, and of course, it's, of course, it's not going to the UK or Empire. They had to pay the, uh, the postage. And the postage has been paid for by the 10 cents uh, stamp. So once again, a pretty item. A shame about the, um, the wax seal oil is uh, mm -hmm. showing through, but show me another one, as they say. Anyway, <laughs> that's it. So, uh, do I oh. John, could you do me a favor and go back to that slide of the, the um, what you virtually cut in half? <laughs> yeah. Um, uh -huh. The top half of that. Can you go back to the top half of that? Yeah. Yeah. I'm new to this and I'm not real sure what that's talking about, but it says the Malay and the next word, I don't know what that is. Characters are indicated at sides. Chinese. 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 Is, that Chinese? is that that word? 
Yes. Oh, yeah. Couldn't read that. Okay. It's rather Thanks. strange to see, but yes, it is Chinese. Okay, that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. John, there's a lovely example of Hamilton's signature there. That must be the definitive for the um, use on the uh, turning them into one dollars. Mm. Yes, yes, indeed. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, there's a lot of forgeries of those about to believe, but here we are, absolutely guaranteed that this is his handwriting. Yeah, I've got a postal stationery card, the Bruin postal stationery card, which was sent by Hamilton to one of the residents of Le Bourne, um, wishing them a happy, uh, happy Christmas and happy new year. And it's franked with a stamp from January the 1st and December the 20th, sorry, a postmark of January the 1st and, uh, uh, and uh, December the 25th of whatever year it was. And that's rather a favorite item as well. And he, his signature is very, very um, steady. Let's put it this way, it doesn't change. Um, of course, it's uh, ASH, of course, on the one dollar stamp. Uh, anyway, that's uh, that's it. So thank you very much. So I stop sharing now, do I? Yes. Or you, you get rid of me or whatever. <laughs> there we are. <laughs> Any more comments from anyone? I think Ray, that that. Uh, that's it. So can we thank you uh, virtually with a, a wave or something? <laughs> yes, that's it. <laughs> it's okay. Perfect stuff, Ray. Yay. Yep.